Welcome everyone. I am sitting here with a very interesting guest and his name is Kurs Kotze. And he has a very interesting background and a very interesting story. And uh, I don't want to preempt it and therefore I will ask him to tell us something about his story. Well, Kurs, welcome here and thank you for coming to tell about your very interesting journey. And uh, I don't know how much of your background you can divulge, but tell us a little bit of where you come from and why you are sitting in this chair today. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for all of you for, for having me. I can tell you I've been following your works and that of Martin was sitting that side behind the cameras for many years. I don't miss it. It really made a difference to me. As for my background, I'm South African, if you can hear from my accent. I grew up in uh, the old apartheid South Africa. I had good parents, Christian people. They uh, would take me to the Inge Kerk. That's the Dutch Reformed one, which was almost like a state religion, if I can use that word. <laughs> Everybody went to the Inge Kerk, and they were everywhere, in every town. And the pastors, pastors called uh, Dominis, they were very, very important people. And may I say so, they were educated people, they were at master's degree level, people looked up to them. But there was something wrong with me. I, I, I started reading at the age of five. I think I read my first 100 page book by five and a half on military history of all things. I was very, very fascinated by all these things. And every time when my parents would take me to church, and that would be every single Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning, we would arrive there, all dressed very neatly, you know, so we would have uh, our suits on. And I, here at those days I had like an Afro hairstyle with curls, so they, were, they were neat, nails, everything. We would arrive there at church and we would sit down and I found it extremely boring. I had no connection to God whatsoever in that church, nothing. He just didn't speak to me. And then a bit later because this happened now for the next 12 years because you go to school for 12 years in South Africa unless you fail. I never failed, thank God. And uh, so we, we would take us to church and later you would get on your motorbike and you would go there yourself and in the last year, in the matric year, you actually go to church twice, in the morning as well as in the evening because the elders now want to see that you are committed. And the school I was in, all the African schools were very, very religious and Protestant. But, Prof, it didn't work for me. I, I get, got angry when I walked into that church. And I stayed angry. Why did you get angry? I didn't know at that stage. At one stage I thought I was possessed or something, but uh, then I started looking at your videos and I realized I was seeing occult signs inside the church. I was seeing things which comes directly from the Roman Catholics over to us. And then in, when I started studying these things, and I studied for many years because I tried to, to prove you wrong, I want to say to people out there, don't, don't go that route. You, you, you waste your time. You're not going to prove the prof wrong. Uh, so many of us tried to do it. But then I, I realized that there were certain things we were doing in the church which just didn't work with me. I think it's the Holy Spirit who was working on me even at that age. Thank God I wasn't abandoned as I thought I was. Yes, one gets the feeling that God abandons one, but he doesn't. He goes and collects one again. Yes, and, and then I went to the police. I joined the South African Police Force in 1985, uh, very deliberately. Uh, I was called up for the army, but I grew up in a place called Katima Mulilo, which is in Caprivi. And we also lived some time in a place called Korihas where uh, its previous name was Valvicha, after that plant. That is yes, plant. the Valvicha plant. Yes, I can tell you, so if you now move schools, and I moved a lot, because my parents were working for the state, uh, you get to a new school and this teacher asks, you know, where are you from, Boot? I said, I'm from Korihas or Valvicha. Katima Mulilo, first thing you ask, you spell it. Well, <laughs> So can I, can I call my elder sister? <laughs> I don't know how to spell that. Um, when I saw the policeman there, especially in Katima Mulilo, I saw the policeman in their camouflage uniform, 
And these these guys look like real uncles to me, you know. They look like tough guys. They had like those vicious snore moustache, and they look just they look manly, you know. They look like people who could who could fight. And then of course, um, from a history viewpoint, I love history absolutely. So I love history. I I knew that the police were very effective. Now, whether the war was wrong or right, that's not what I want to discuss. But I can tell you that seventy four percent of all the so-called terrorists uh, were killed by the police in, in Namibia, in Wambuland, by the unit called Kufut, which I was not part of. But I was part of the police counterinsurgency units. And uh, inside South Africa, I think it was 98%. So if you wanted to fight, and which young man sir, doesn't, once you're in uniform and you're like a man and you feel proud and you feel strong and you're, you're a little bit stupid, you haven't seen your own death yet, you, uh, you, you do want to fight, you want to spoil, you, you want to see who's the best, who's the man, yeah. And so I joined the police in 85 and I stayed until for six years. I was at one stage, I think I was about, just reached the age of 21, I became a full sergeant. This was one of the youngest and there I stayed for many reasons. Uh, probably I had to do with my outspoken attitude and also in those days, if you do your job properly, there's always an assault case against you. Or well, something is holding you back from becoming a warrant officer. Uh, but in the police, we were very religious as well. We were, um, we had prayer parades, and there were no such thing as an atheist in the police. It didn't exist. In fact, officially, it could not exist. If you, uh, on a Sunday morning, you would have a church parade in the police college, and may I say to you people, the South African police college of those days were really not like the police uh, academy movies you've seen. They, they had nothing like that. It was like a total basic training and tough training for six months. And uh, every Sunday you would be on parade, it's a church parade, and then they would call out spark plugs. Uh, it's an Ingekerkse that has to do with a, a spark plug. There was a spark plug called NGK in South Africa in my oh, story. Yes. Uh, so they called us spark plugs and they said, hey, hey, they can't. Of course, they say these things at the top of their voice. So, so we ran. You go that way, you form up there, and then you go to the church actually inside the police college, because of course they had like a Ingekerk. And they had the chaplains there. Uh, the Catholics would go that side, and uh, Bishop Tito, Tito's people, uh, they, they would go there. And then there's a few Jew boys, I don't know why they were there. They would go somewhere, but no one is left on that parade ground. Uh, but it was a thing. Actually, uh, a few weeks ago I recorded uh, for my other channel, I recorded a very legendary sergeant major called Quas Crocodile. Uh, he was. Uh, I've heard about Quas Crocodile. Yes, uh, he's, he's, he's a fantastic fellow. I, I was astonished with him. Uh, he was an RSM actually of a parachute battalion as well as Frito battalion, which is famous units. And he told a joke, and I will quote him with his permission, of course. He said they were standing there, and the same story happened in the army, of course, because the police were like the army, it's the same thing. Uh, with arresting powers. As I always say, look at the US Marines with the ability to arrest you. Then you, then you talk about the old South African police force. And so he was telling there was one one guy just standing alone there because everyone has now gone and here he's standing. So Chris Crocodile arrives with his magnificent voice. So you were in the army yourself. His RSMs, you have him two miles away. I mean, they just, man, they just, they, 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 they something else. So anyway, to make a long story short, he asked this guy, uh, now what are you? And he says, I'm an atheist, sir. I'm an atheist. Sir. He says, man, to the Catholics. So the guy was sent there and he had to go. Now, whoever goes crocodile now, I realized at that stage why I would find that as a seventh day person very, very funny. I don't know. Uh, but that's how it was in the police. And then every time when you get onto duty, you would have also a parade uh, and you would in inspect yourself, your uniform. Your, your weapons, your ammunition, everything would be checked. Um, and a short prayer would be said. And that was the same on the border duty, township duty, with riots everywhere. Uh, you were expected as a sergeant or as whoever is in charge to, to say a prayer. You had a small little Bible that the Gideons gave us. And uh, that story that it will stop a bullet is not true. I once won a crate of beer, so I shot right through it with my R1 rifle, which is a 7.62 NATO, NATO round. Of course, I must say the chaplain was not amused 
of me doing that, but I needed to know because, and, 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 and in fact, the, we, we do have on my other channel, we do have people testifying that the Bible did stop some bullets. And I know some of the special forces people would actually take the Afrikaans little Bible with them behind enemy lines. And when they said to them, look, you can't do that because they search you before you actually go, they said, look, man, the moment I start speaking, people will know where I'm from. It doesn't matter. And if I'm dead, I'm dead, but I'm taking my Bible with. Other people like uh, Major Jack Griff, uh, um, uh, the small teams expert, which, by which I mean not more than two people jumping or going by submarine far behind enemy lines for weeks at a time, the Norris Crooks holder, he says in his book he would actually take photostats, copies of, um, of say, Spreke, yes. he would Proverbs, he would take that with and so forth. But even that's where we made jokes about. I recall during training and counterinsurgency, we were running up a hill which was called Polio. I tell you, sir, I don't know why there's any military training ground which doesn't have a hill somewhere. They must have a hill. They must have a hill, sir, and there's a path there out there. It's like foot puyer. You, you just run up there all the time. So we, I was running up Polio, and I'm going. Not that I'm a good runner. I can walk far, but I'm not a good runner. And so this warrant officer is here behind me going on. And I turned around and I said, I said, warrant, it's like a sergeant major in the army. I said, warrant, are, are you a man of a church? And he says, yeah, yeah, I'm an elder, you know. I said, sir, don't you read the Bible? He says, I read the Bible. I said, well, you obviously didn't read uh, Proverbs 28 verse 1. And he says, uh, I said, only Slechts die God loose sal haar koop sonder om gejaagd te word. <laughs> Which is... <laughs> only uh, the ungodly will yes, run without being ungodly. chased. Yes, so... So, of course, he being a practical man, so he put me in front of his Land Cruiser. And I ran with that R1 rifle and full kit above my head all the way to the... to the shooting range and back, which is probably 25 kilos each way. And I didn't quite make it back, but by that time he has calmed down a bit. So, so that was a milieu which we lived in, and of course in the police, we lost people. At my unit, at the flying squad, we, we once lost three, three constables to death at one go. We have to give him a full military funeral. I felt very sorry for the colonels and the senior guys. Like the commander, because we had to speak to the family. Like we, we, we wouldn't. We made other jokes in the service, so we would say to somebody, look, if he's lying there bleeding out and you're trying to stop the blood because we did the medical courses as well, they say the best way, sir, to get this guy to survive is just to ask him for the phone number of his girlfriend, since he's going to die anyway and he'll take care of her or his wife. It's a miracle, sir. He stops her blood flow himself and he just gets up just to spite you. So, so we were joking with God, but, but deep behind it, we were very serious about it as well. But still, I couldn't find the church. I, I did not feel happy in the in the Inge Kirk, and so I started searching, and uh, I even went to these uh, prosperity, I think we call it people, uh, come to Jesus, you'll be a rich man. Well, <laughs> I can tell you, and as a police sergeant, I earned less money than a sweeper in the beer breweries, so rich we were definitely not. And then later years, I became still searching, I would go to this Leben de Woord and all these people, and I'm not saying they are not uh, sincere in what they do, I'm not saying that, let me be on clear here, uh, but I didn't really feel any connection, still I couldn't. So I, there was something that was missing, something that you couldn't find, and there was an emptiness. There was an emptiness, I knew there was something wrong. Um, and then I lost a, a, a wife to death, and then I lost another one, and that was the damn turning point. Because I, I always took for granted that me being the man, I'm the oldest man, I should die first. What's wrong with this? This is, this is just wrong. How, how, how is this possible that, that, I mean, she should be burying me. I mean, that's the way of life. And, and, and suddenly I stood there the second time, which was in uh, the 21st of May, 2014. And the funny thing about us, we were only eight days together. Sure. Because we were eight days together and then she went back to the US and I'm banned in the US because of many reasons I can think of. 
what cannot say you on, on, on TV. Uh, basically, sometimes when you work on counterterrorism, you are seen with people and they, being very smart people, and I'm being sarcastic, they just say, okay, you're seen with these undesirables. I remember the first time they said that to me, I said, well, you know, I'm an attorney by profession, or I used to be. Uh, they are all unsavory people, if you think about it. But no, I mean, my joke didn't work with him either. So. Yeah. But when, when Melissa died, and uh, I'll never forget that day, she was getting more ill and more ill and more in the hospital, and then her organs started packing up, and she was all yellow in the face and bloated. And her sister, who was a dear woman, she said to me, she called and she said to me, because I wasn't there, I was still in South Africa, she died in Orlando, in the US. And uh, she asked me, how do I feel about switching the machines off? Now, as a former attorney, so I will say to anybody listening here, get your living well in order. Speak to your loved ones. Let them really understand what's your wishes. We need to understand once you're dead, do we bury you? Do we cremate you? I need your passwords for your uh, Facebook, all those things. These are practical matters. It's not religion, but it really helps those to stay behind. And above all, if you're a vegetable or in a coma, there is no way out of this. You know what, for me, as Missy said to me, release my soul to the care of God. And so I was not, um, I had no hesitation in saying if that's the way it is, then release a soul. The problem is people don't always die immediately, so when you switch the machines off, there was a legal case where a, uh, a medical doctor went for a stupid little operation, something went wrong with a nar narcosa. And so he, um, he became, we had to switch off, but there was nothing wrong with his body. So they knew if they switched these, these things off, he might still live for a few weeks, a week or two, to die of actually of first or whatever. He was not going to die, he's just not the, So it's, it's a bad thing to watch, to witness it. It's also so that I spoke to many doctors and nurses and they all say to me that those who found peace with God, they die easily, sir. They don't fight it. They, they know it's a time. They know what Martin Luther has said about uh, soul sleep. They're not scared. But those who are not like that, I've seen it with my own eyes as well. They do suffer. They, they do fight. They, it's like there's some demon or something in that room. They don't want to die. They have absolute terror, terror fight. They, they're extremely scared. But anyway, when, when Missy died, I, um, I, I sat like this. I was crying for eight days. It's <laughs> the only time in my life where I actually cried so much that I had to wrench out the, the pillows. Uh -huh. It was that bad for me because my life came crashing down. I was like, man, I had plans here for us. And uh, we were new beginnings, you know. It was very hard. It was very hard. And so... I said to myself, Chris, and you question God, where is God yeah. in all of this? So I said to myself, of course, you have two choices. You run towards God, or you run away from God, you start a fight which you're going to lose. Which is the two are you going to make this decision? And it was easy for me. I just said, I'll run towards Jesus. He says he's a God of love. And, well, I'll take his word. And I ran towards him. And so you were involved in the police, and then later in uh, basically in intelligence and you have a very checkered background and we don't want to really talk about all the things that happened there but uh, you were married to people that were also involved in the same sort of sphere isn't that correct well so you know you date those who's around you Yes. You know, when you're in a secret of a society, you, you do tend to open up to the people. So yes, my, my, the first one was also involved in, in that world. Let's call it the shadows. I, I can't really explain too much about it. Um, but I left the world. But even in that world, so certain things didn't make sense to me because we were working on counterterrorism in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, I have to explain to the people here that the new battlefield, if you want to look for jihadis, for those who kills Christians, who hates Christians. And I don't want to go in why or why not, that's a political thing, it's not, I'm just saying facts. You're not going to find them in the Middle East so much anymore. Uh, 
the Mossad and the uh, Americans and others are chasing them around there and they're killing them. So there's a huge battle going on which people don't really know about. It's the entire world below the world which we know. There's nothing normal about the world because there's no rules. As a police officer, I would never even consider killing somebody without knowing I'm going to have to defend myself in court. But in the shadows, I have no such restrictions. Let me put it like that. So you can go and have certain things happen. So within this world that you were in, where you were working within the shadow world, you were working with all of these parameters, you realized there is something that is amiss, something that you can't put your finger on, and you had you had religious respect and you had um, exposure to all of these things, but wherever you turned, the answers were lacking. How did you get to answers that actually satisfied the hunger in your soul? Yeah, it made no sense. That's exactly what happened, because Sub-Saharan Africa became a hotpot for all these jihadis. So we were watching them, looking at them and doing things. But it seemed to us that there's a pattern forming here, that there's some, something happening, something is controlling this. If I can make an example, practically speaking, when you look at the mosque, the way it's built, I can deduct who paid for that mosque to be built. They don't look the same. A Shia mosque will not look the same as a Sunni mosque. And we just have to clarify also that not all Muslim people are terrorists. I just want to be clear. It's a very small minority of them, but they are very, very active. And so we started noticing these mosques coming up and we started looking at them. And by the way of looking at them, we realized uh, they're from the Sunni faith and they're also being paid for by Saudi Arabia. Fine. A few years ago, the Saudis said they will not do this anymore, and then they broke their word within a month or two, and they just carried on like always. But if you look at this uh, from, a, from a higher viewpoint, a strategic viewpoint, not tactical, from strategic, it is impossible to understand why Saudi and the US of A is these big mates. Why are they partners? Uh, how is that possible? Because the Saudi money is paying for the uh, for ISIS as well as Al-Qaeda, those are Sunni Muslims, they're not Shia. And Shia, Iran, is the arch enemy of, of the US. If, if they can wipe each other out, they will do so. But at the same time, as the way I understood it, the Sunnis and the Shias don't like each other either. They are really, they, they are like Roman Catholics used to be and uh, the Protestants, they, they were not, they were wars being fought with, with these people. And yet here you see a nominally uh, Protestant country like the US, a very, very powerful one, is now made to the guys who is actually supporting the terrorism and building all these mosques and preparing for the second wave to come in. How, how do you get this together? It makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And from that we started looking, or I did, I started looking at it from a viewpoint of um, strategic and I started asking myself, right, who is the US? Is it the second beast? Who is the second beast answering to? First beast? Who's the Antichrist? And those answers I got from all of your lectures. And that started happening in 2016. And somebody asked me and said, do you know this, this Professor Walter J. Weif? And I said, well, I heard about the guy. He had a problem with milk. And I once saw a <laughs> file of him, and I won't explain more about that, but the file was this big. And then later I saw the same file, and it was like fun. Somebody cleared that file out. And I started watching that program of yours in Copenhagen. Okay. And I sat there and I said to myself, man, this guy's now turning my entire damn world upside down. Uh, but I couldn't stop watching. And I said to myself after a while, yes, now I'm beginning to understand what I've seen in the shadows are starting to make sense to me now. All these secret organizations, all these stupid little handshakes, these occult signs, it starts making sense to me what I've seen. And I started watching and watching and, uh, well, today we're sitting here. Well, you know what, once you start unraveling the things and seeing the bigger picture, that's one thing. And it's interesting and it's important because 
it opens the eyes and you see the connections. But once you've done that, you have to start focusing on what's the war really about then? The war is really about Jesus. Because there's a war going on against Jesus. And uh, once you start discovering the real Jesus, the one in the Bible, and what he is about, and uh, what his character is like, and when you start thinking about justice and mercy and all of these things, then the Bible becomes a different book, doesn't it? Doesn't it come to life? Doesn't it? Yes, sort of it, 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 it becomes you? interesting. Up to then, it, for me, it was just a book. You read it because you have to. You expect it to do so. I would go as far as read the, I think, from Proverbs, enjoy the life of a woman you love. But I would read that when you're on the border. There ain't no woman there. There might be a few sheep, but, you know. <laughs> so I would do that type of thing because I was, in, in, in a certain way, I was joking about it. Yes. And then you suddenly realize these things and you understand that every word in the Bible is actually means something. And you can't escape it because there is a choice to be made. Yes. You and can. even a simple story about a woman in the Bible is actually an allegory or a greater reality about a church and the consequences of whatever is happening around her. And uh, adultery in the Bible is a symbol of apostasy towards God then it, it starts getting a different meaning, doesn't it? Yeah, no, it does. And, and then I got quite upset as well, I have to tell, with all these dominies who didn't tell me the truth, because I have to presume one of two things. Either they knew it and they didn't tell me, or they didn't know it, and then I want to know why not. Because if you come to me as a legal expert, you expect me to actually know the answers. You do not expect me to take you on the road which is going to cost you a life, never mind money. Uh, so that, that was hard for me as well. And I started listening more and more to you and tried to prove you wrong. And I realized quite quickly, I'm not going to prove you wrong. And so I started watching absolutely everything. And the entire world went up. And then came Ellen G. White. That must have been a problem. Before we get to Ellen G. White, I must just tell the viewers that uh, Quiz has a tremendous background, as we have said. He has a, this checkered life and being also in the legal system, a lawyer, and all of these all wrapped into one, uh, that is quite a package. And to try and connect all the dots when it comes to that is, is quite something. And I think it's amazing how you did it. But he's also an author. And he wrote many, many books. And the books were changed, of course, by his new discoveries. And so what he did, he actually wove the truth into a fictional situation. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, yes. What happened was, is I wrote these books. I, after Melissa died, I was angry. So even though I was running towards God, I was feeling a bit lost. So I started writing these books, average 450 pages every three weeks. Ooh, People say to me, it cannot be done, but I assure you, it, it was done. And I type with two fingers, so, uh, uh, so I would almost go into a trance while I was working. I would sit on my chair, I had a patented thing, where it's not really patented, but I thought it was clever. I would take a, a nice lazy boy type of chair and a plank, a plank over like this, and I put my laptop on it and I just work. And there I would sit and I would get seriously obnoxious if anybody disturbed me. I would work from 6 in the morning till 10 at night. And so I kept on pumping these books out. And, the and books, you would weave yes. a, a book of intrigue, but actually True. show the real connections behind everything into the book? Absolutely. If, if I can mention one, his code name was Samole something. can't even remember the entire name. There's 51 of them. So... There I, I looked at, at, at Ricky or Ritzi, uh, the, the Jesuit general. Yes. And what, what struck me immediately, because uh, we look in my world, we look for something which is strange, which doesn't fit. So if Ritzi, Ricky or Ritzi was this horrible general, and you know, the Jesuits got banned on the ring, blah, 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 why was he buried in with full military honors there where he's buried? 
makes no sense. So that doesn't no make click, sense. Bing, right? something happened. Then I listened to you and you said, talked about this strange professor who was making the speeches there. And if you people don't know what I'm talking about, Prof, you, you can explain or we can put a link in where you were talking. Put the link in. Put the link in. Yes, it's all in yes. about the art of war and the all of, of these war. issues. Yes. And, and the one thing which kept on coming up is the Jesuit order. Jesuit order kept on coming up, even in my life. They were controlling there. I mean, all the heads of the CIA just happens to be, just by chance, very prominent, very serious Catholics. What about the OSS, the Office for Strategic Services? Well, Bill Donovan, same story. How's this possible? FBI, same story. And I started realizing there's patterns going on here. And what I would do in the books is I would start pointing this out, the same as the U.S. Supreme Court. You would expect the Supreme Court to have at least a few Protestants there. I mean, no, 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 not one, not one. Now, as long as they stay to the laws of the country, you can still argue, okay, it's fine. But they not. They overturned Roe versus Wade. You have to wonder why. And I understand very recently, they said, okay, well, we've overturned it, but you can still do it, though, uh, in certain cases and blah, blah, blah. So how far they went. But these things started bothering me, and so I said to myself in the last 12 books I wrote, I started writing in all these ideas, and I would make the characters discuss it between themselves. And I always say to people in these books, there's a couple of things about these books you need to know. Even though there some of them, most of them, 47 of them would be classified as, uh, as fiction, whatever these characters have to say, whatever weapons are used, whatever techniques are used, by craft or... Uh, sabotage or whatever, those most definitely you can take to heart. And you can go and research, you're going to be very surprised what comes out. So I thought so I'll use the Jesuit techniques of Hollywood against themselves. Excellent. And then, then something strange happened. Uh, by this time I was uh, living in Switzerland with my wife. I met somebody else. I'm very happily married now. I'm grateful to God for sending me someone again. Last time. Better be the last time. And uh, she and her mom went to Budapest. They want to go to the baths or something. But because of my background, I'm not welcome in most NATO countries, and I'm a bit hesitant in going into any country. I'm even hesitant on where I fly, what, what airline I fly. I have to be sure. I, I will actually arrive on the other side without being arrested and deported. And not that I've done anything wrong, but sometimes you're seen with people who they don't like which I believe is actually what happened. But whatever, they don't explain. So she went to, uh, with her mom to, to Budapest, and I decided I'm going to write all this knowledge I've learned from you and Ellen White, and what I've seen, I'm going to put that in a non-fictional book called Oath of Evil, The War on Protestantism. And then I started right in the beginning, who's these Jesuits? Let's look at their oath. Let's look if they are perhaps a uh, sect because they like to call the Seventh-day Adventist Church a sect. Yes. But it's a very big sect, isn't it, sir? 22 million of them, right across the world. And they live 11 years longer than anybody else. And I have to tell you about that, too, because when I became vegan, uh, by that time I was a diabetic. I was a lot fatter than what I'm now. I still need to lose weight. I realize that. And I was unable to sleep without this oxygen thing on me called uh, slop up new or something, I don't know it's in English. So I lost about 30 kilos almost immediately. Uh, I haven't tested my blood uh, for diabetes too. Well, in the last few years, I only tested it when flying to South Africa uh, because I was poisoned on the aircraft and it just shot up. But before that and after that, never. Everything works in my body. I'm not gonna explain that as well because it didn't work before. <laughs> And then uh, I just feel great, and I eat, and I don't feel guilty. I have not murdered one of God's creatures. The health message the is health message. the right arm of the gospel. And uh, do you find also that once you have accepted that, that your, your clarity improves? My clarity improved dramatically. I suddenly had my brain back. I can remember almost like photographic, almost everything I need to remember. It's just fantastic. I could 
I could live again. So it was like a new life. And you know the greatest thing about vegan? I, it, it's no hardship. The food are fantastic. If you make these uh, date balls with uh, dates and uh, uh, nuts, and that's the best ever. I can make my own ice cream with uh, frozen bananas and a little bit of coconut milk. And so, so no, it was fantastic. It changed my life. And then you were talking about the other problem child, Ellen G. White. How did you react to this discovery and what did you do when you started reading? I've heard you say that they abused you about Ellen G. White. So I tried it with a few friends and they abused me. And then I said, man, I've got to read this. <laughs> this is, if, if she's done so badly, the same as you say, I mean, if your name is mentioned, some of it just goes insane. And you ask them why, when they can't answer you, they just ask curse words. Anyway, we have to pray for them too. And uh, so I, I read uh, Steps to Christ, and then the greatest one of them all, the great controversy. For me, it just opened the Bible. And I read it, and I just couldn't believe what I'm reading. And I thought to myself, oh, if, 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 it's simple. It's not, it's not a closed book anymore. I can read here, and I can read in my King James. Uh, and, and that's the only Bible I read, King James Version. And uh, it just opened it, and it's just fantastic. And then people started attacking me, of course, yeah, they're no prophetess. Uh, people are skeptical, and they should be skeptical. Yes, in these they have the right to be skeptical, but uh, if you are wise, investigate all things, hold on to what is good. Exactly. And you know, so the easiest thing in, in with my life now is I just trust God. Even for me to sit here is almost a miracle. I mean, I'm not supposed to be here with you now. I'm supposed to be in Mozambique to get another place where we can grow our own food, things like that. And uh, then I prayed about it because I was not expecting to meet you and Martin and everyone. And again, thank you. So it, it's a great privilege. And I, it's uh, my privilege. Yeah, and, and then I <laughs> and then I prayed to God and I said, that's about two, three weeks ago. And I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm supposed to go there. I, you know, I want to follow your ways. You, you told us to get out of the cities. You told me to get planting. I know nothing about planting, but I can learn uh, how hard can it be. We want this place. I know what's coming. I, I know what's coming. Every, any Seventh-day Adventist can tell you in the end times and can tell you why. And they can also say to you, there's hardship coming. This the story with COVID. It's just a throw around. Trust me. A lot worse is going to happen. So I need this piece of ground and I have the money to buy it. Or my wife does and she agrees. And so this is important to me. I actually have to go and do it. And then suddenly I hear now that I can actually meet with you people, but now the dates are clashing and I'm not alone there. There's some special forces mates going with me. We have plans. And I left it to God and I said, Lord, don't ever let me have my way because I'll screw up. I know myself. I'm born in sin and I'm a sinful person. I try my best, but you know I'm not that reliable, even though I try. So you take command, always you take command, sort this out. And I forgot about it. And then suddenly the Special Forces chap who's a, who's a committed Christian, he says to me, yeah, he goes, yeah, you know, but perhaps you should go next week. And I'm like, yeah, Lord, that's it. That's it. That's your answer. I said, yes, yes, I agree with you, my man. We should go next week. And then we wouldn't even go because suddenly this guy sends us uh, all the footage we need to show around and things. And then I said, well, even that is sorted. Then I don't need to go to Mozambique anymore. I can show the footage to my wife, we can go there together, or wherever we go, we'll get a place. So for me to even be here with you, I see the hand of, of the Lord. And I had to destroy almost two cars to get here. Uh, the first car I rented, um, very cheap Suzuki, the cheapest we can get. Nice car, but the radio didn't work well with me, didn't like me. It had like these 1980s discos, it runs like this all the time, and it's distracting, and I'm at a certain age, I'm not interested in this. And worst of all, on my memory stick, it only plays the first nine songs. Now, I do like my religious music very much, but nine songs over 4,000 kilos was driving me nuts. <laughs> so I returned the car. So give me another car. I'm just outside of the airport, about two miles away, aircon on. Again, I'm at a certain age. I love, like my aircon, put the aircon on. Well, the aircon doesn't work. And so I decide, man, I'm taking this bag as well. 
So I go back and they want to charge me for a whole bunch of things. We start an argument. I say to them, look, my cause is right. I'm not a practicing attorney anymore, but I will definitely, I'm telling you, I will cost you more money than you will cost me. And so we sorted that out. But by that time, I'm so angry. I walk about half a mile, and it's a good thing to walk. It, it takes the anger out of you. And so I stroll down that street in the old church street. And I could get, get to this new company, and uh, they gave me a very, very, very nice upgrade on what I had, a very nice car. And then I have to talk about Martin, who's sitting there grinning there behind the cameras. He just tells me, get to Hootsprite. And I said, I don't even know if Hootsprite's in the Purple or Mapumalanga. You know, I haven't been here. But I might have been because I did go to school at Giani, uh -huh. which I think is not too far away from Zanin. So it must be in the area. But anyway, the GPS, let's blame the Americans and Ronald Reagan for the GPS at night of. Uh, Night of Malta, I believe Reagan was. Yes. And so the GPS took me to Leidenburg or something. When I was driving on the pavement at one stage, legally, because there's no road. The, um, that town is almost trashed. It is gone. It's, 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 it's incredible. Even the road, they just disappeared. There's no road. I, I drove about 30 kilometers in second gear. And uh, I wouldn't say where I rented the car, but let me tell you, you can go very far in four-wheel drive of a car which you rent, but nothing happened to the car. The point I'm making is it was not that easy to get to you. And I thank the Lord that I did. Well, I'm glad you're here. And, uh, you know, when God calls someone, He calls them not only because He loves them and because He saved them, He calls them because they can be of service in His vineyard. And everybody gets the commission. And you with your background and your military background and your police background and legal background and uh, you know shadow world background, let's put it that way, you can reach people that other people can't reach. And God gives you this great gift and he says, go ye into all the world and preach it. And you started your own your own channel, and you reach out to people that others cannot get to. So may God bless you and keep you, and may He use you mightily, and may many, many people who are confused and don't know what's going on in the world, they want to do what is right, they want to serve a good purpose, they want to uphold laws, they want to see that things are right, and then like you, they start realizing there are certain things that are that just don't gel, that don't make sense. And if they can find the answer and find the source of all truth and be saved, then all this will have been worth it. So may God bless you in, in what you do and uh, let's ask God to help you with your ministry. You. Heavenly Father, it was a privilege to speak to Quis and he has access to ears that not everybody has access to. And I pray, pray that you will use him mightily in your work and that your kingdom will expand and that the sea of glass will have to be expanded as a consequence. Bless him and bless what he does and bring him back safely to his loved ones. He's been through a rough time as well. Bless him, bless him in his marriage, bless him in his life. And bless him in the work that he does. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.